He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You may not know it by looking at me now, um, but I, at one point in time in my life, was a basketball star. Um, and by basketball star, I mean barely made the team um, and, and almost never played. Um, in fact, I brought a photo just to prove that this was a, a reality, that uh, this is in my high school career here. You don't understand how rare of a photo this is because I appear to be actually involved in a game, which means we were probably down by 30 or so at this point in time, and the coach, out of just sort of mercy, decided to throw me in there. Um, but my team was not um, good, which makes the fact that I never played actually a little worse. Um, and, and, but occasionally, we would find ourselves in a close game. Occasionally, we would find ourselves in a situation where we even had a chance to win. Um, and, and when the moment would come and, and we had the ball at the end of the game and your coach calls timeout and there's maybe 10 seconds left or so and he, he circles everybody up, right? I would take my, I would come from my spot down there by the water cooler and stand around the guys that, that actually play in the game and listen to what the coach was saying. He would take his whiteboard and he would draw up the play that he wanted to run and he would go over all kinds of details about who, what inbound play we were gonna do and how we were gonna try to get the ball to our best player to take the last shot. And he would draw everything up, all the details that he wanted us to remember, that he wanted to have executed on the floor. And then at the last moment, you would, everybody would put their hands in the huddle and before we would break, the coach would look the five guys that are going out on the floor to finish the game, right? And he would say something the equivalent to like, don't forget your fundamentals, right? Don't, don't forget to set a good pick. Don't, don't forget to make crisp passes. Don't forget to be sharp. Whatever it was, whether we were on defense or offense, after all the details, all the information, everything that we were supposed to remember, the last words that he would say to us are don't forget to do the things that we practice a thousand times over the course of this season. But don't forget your fundamentals. I mean, today we're wrapping up our series on the book of Colossians. This letter that, that Paul has written to a group of people that he's never met, um, that he has never personally had inter, inter, any interactions with. And, and, and today, Paul, we're going to see, is starting to kind of wrap up his instructions and his teaching to the church and the Christians in Colossae. He's giving his final thoughts, and as he does so, he, he, you almost get this moment when he is sort of metaphorically looking him in the eyes and saying, don't, don't forget the fundamentals. Paul has been spending now the, the majority of this letter really doing one of two things. First, he has been unequivocally and unabashedly teaching the church about who Jesus is. It has been a focus of his letter. It's been a focus of our series together. We've been memorizing together this part from these verses from Colossians chapter 1. In fact, let's recite these together one last time. I'm not going to put any blanks. We're just going to do this the easy way, but would you read this with me? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. So, right, Paul has just given this, these rich theological truths about who Jesus is, about how Jesus is to be at the center of everything. He, he created it all, and it's all for him. He's at the center of our very lives as followers of Jesus. 
But then after, after all of this deep theological truth on who Jesus is, he, he sort of pivots and he really gets into the practical. This is the second thing that we've seen in this letter that, that Paul has just been focusing on. He, he talks about how to apply the, the truth of who Jesus is. If Jesus is the center of everything, then how does that affect the way that we live? How does it, to the church living in Colossae, how does it inform the way they respond to all of these different philosophies and ideas that want to sort of suggest to them that perhaps Jesus isn't at the center of everything, or perhaps Jesus is one among many things at the center of everything, or that in one regard or another, perhaps Jesus and Jesus alone isn't enough. So, so Paul takes this on. And he tells us things like in chapter 3 to set our hearts and our minds on things above. He instructs us to take off the old self with its practices and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. He even gets into, if you remember from, from last week, he gets into how this truth about Jesus, how the gospel shapes and informs some of the foundational relationships in society particularly relationships where in their culture and world, there was a, there was a very clear authority structure that was at play. How does, how does the gospel shape and form the way we understand how we operate when we're under authority and we are operating with authority? How does the gospel shape and form that? And Paul speaks directly into it because he reminds us that no matter what the case, no matter which one of those we find ourselves in at some point in time or the other, and most of us in life will find ourselves in both of those, he says we all are under a greater authority. We all are ultimately under the authority of Jesus, and that's what shapes our lives and our relationships. And so now he's given us all this this theology after all of that, and this, this, this practical application of how a fuller understanding of Jesus shapes our lives, he, he's wrapping up his letter to the church, and he says, but, but don't forget the fundamentals. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 2 through 6 together and then just process for a bit some of what Paul says here. This is what he writes to the church. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the ways you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity and let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so here, as, as Paul is concluding this, as he's wrapping this letter up, this, this deeply theologically and yet deeply practical letter, he, he looks at the church sort of metaphorically and he says, don't, don't forget the fundamentals. Don't forget the fundamental of prayer and don't forget the fundamental of purpose. And that's what I want us to look at together today. Let's begin by talking about the fundamental of prayer. The fundamental aspect of prayer in our lives. In no uncertain terms, Paul says at the very outset of this section of his letter, he says, devote yourselves to prayer. Commit yourselves to prayer. Be dedicated to prayer, church. This is important. This is essential in your life. When I was a youth pastor, I, uh, one of the things I used to love and experience in that was when one of our students who maybe didn't grow up around the church or didn't grow up hearing people pray. And so sometimes then they, in high school, they would hear the gospel and they would respond to it and they would begin this relationship with Jesus and be excited about that and, and maybe have opportunity to pray in, in kind of a corporate setting. And yet they didn't have kind of the standard lingo that Christians so oftentimes use when we pray. And, and they didn't know the verbiage. And so they would just talk. Oftentimes the way they would talk to anybody else. In fact, I, in fact, I can remember this one student, um, one of the time just began to said, you know, I asked for a volunteer to pray. They raised their hand and, and, uh, and they just started to, to talk and they said, Hey God, um, I'm doing good today. How are you? 
you're probably pretty good because you're God. And, and just, just kind of like had this like, we're just checking in with each other, we're kind of conversation because that's, in their mind, they talk to God exactly like they would talk to everyone else. And there was something that was really authentic and kind of a, almost a, a innocence in the way that they would pray. And what I loved about the nature of the prayer is that at the core of it, at the heart of it, there was no, there was no performance at all because it was strictly relational. All they understood in the infancy of their faith was that I've been brought into a relationship with the Almighty Creator God, and I have this ability to talk to Him. So I'm going to talk to Him the way, the way I would talk to anyone else. It's actually, in so many ways, was instructive to me in, in, in how I pray. See, Paul, at the, at the end of nearly every letter that he writes that we have in the New Testament, you will find some instruction similar to what we just read here in Colossians, where he compels the church to be committed to prayer. He instructs the church on the importance of prayer. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, why is this such a point of emphasis for Paul? Why, why is this so vital that when you're reminding the church, when you're kind of leaving them with your last thoughts, that you consistently come back to this call to, to pray? Why is it so vital in, in our relationship, our ongoing relationship, our desire to live out our faith in Jesus? And I think Paul's, Paul's already made this point because ultimately what, what Jesus has accomplished, the nature of it, the core of it is relational. It's returning us into a right relationship with God. So Paul in chapter one, I don't think I put this on the screen, but in, one, in chapter one, verse 22, he says this. He says, but now, speaking of Jesus, he has reconciled to you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So Paul's description of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf is is relational. And Paul is always, he always seemed concerned about the human propensity to take what is relational what is at its core a, a relationship with God and turn it into religion, turn it into the doing the right things in order to be found sort of acceptable in front of a holy God. And so Paul continually is driving the church back into the, re, the relational nature of what we have as a result of Jesus. He's reminding us again that at the center of all of this, of everything that he's been teaching us, it's a relationship with Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is at the center. It's about him. It's for him. It's by him. And so this is, this is true for, for you and I. It's, it's true of our lives. So his, his point is, is, is almost simple. He's saying, so talk to him about it. Regularly, daily, with each other, separately. Go before God and, and talk with him. If it's for you and it's about you, then it only makes sense for us to spend time talking with the one who who we've been brought into relationship with. Uh, I think of it this way. When I was um, 22 years old, I uh, was just graduating from Moody. Um, I was getting married that summer and was looking for my first job in, in ministry. Um, I had put out a bunch of applications and had a few interviews, but it was sort of like, I'm going to have some very real responsibilities coming at me here soon and, and need to have some way to kind of like provide for my family and all that sort of thing. And so I was called by a church out in Wheaton by a man named Rob Yonan, who was the pastor of student ministries there. And he sat down with me and interviewed me and met Sherry. And, and, and for one reason or another that I don't fully understand, he took a chance on this guy who had very little experience in, in the world of ministry. And Lots of ideas and thoughts, but, but he gave us a chance. And I remember when I first started that job, my office was kind of just down the hall from his, I would constantly be banging on his door, constantly be coming in to ask a question or to get clarity or just to make sure that I was in alignment with his vision for student ministries at that church, to make sure that, that I was still following the track that that he had said, you see, this is, this is Paul's point here. 
is that when, when our lives, when we've been made new in Christ, when everything, when we recognize that everything is about him and it's for him, then, then at the essence, at the core of what he's doing is just go talk to him. Like, I, I, for me, it's so dangerous for me to read right past these words in Colossians. It sounds very Christian. It sounds something that a pastor would say to a church. But this is, this is so much more than just a, a Christian bumper sticker. Paul is emphasizing the need to stay connected relationally and conversationally with Jesus because he is at the center of it all. And so he says, devote yourselves, commit yourselves, be dedicated to, to prayer. Talk to him about it. And he gives us two sort of descriptors or qualifiers of this. He says, first, be watchful. The, the Greek there literally means stay awake. That, that, that the idea being that our prayer life is intended to, to keep us alert, keep us ready. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the second fundamental. But the reason I mention that is this, because that, that, that exhortation there evokes a sense of purpose and activity, stay focused on God's work. Stay so focused on him because he is at work. He's moving, and, and we want to be a part of that. As followers of Jesus, we want to be a part of that work. So he says, be ready by reminding yourselves, reminding us to be connected to him, to talk to him about it. But the second thing that he, he uses to describe this, this devotion and prayer, this relational, conversational aspect that we have with and through Jesus is to be thankful. And, and of course, this is perfect timing, right? We're all about to celebrate Thanksgiving. I have my first Thanksgiving meal uh, this afternoon. Um, oh, I didn't eat breakfast in preparation. And this, this word, and I was reminded by a friend today, one of the, the um, joys that I have is that we'll do like a, a preaching and teaching lab, Pastor Jeff calls it, where those of us that, that are asked to teach in, in various environments in the church get together and we prepare um, and, and then deliver it in front of each other and give feedback and points and say, hey, this, this really worked or um, you could clarify this or whatever. And so this week on this very passage, two of our student ministry pastors, um, Gretchen and Tom, who work with our high school kids, prepared and, and delivered a, a sermon on this, along with John Hokinga, who's our congregational care pastor. And, and I remember Gretchen talking about this, and she was talking about this idea of Thanksgiving. And as she worded it, she said, Thanksgiving offers us perspective. Thanksgiving offers us perspective. And, and first off, with the sort of events of my week, I was in desperate need to be reminded of that. I was, I was in desperate need to, to gain some perspective. And the second thing that just struck me is that, that that's just right. It, it was just an accurate description of what Paul's driving at here. Thanksgiving for you and I, being thankful is born out of an awareness of grace, the, uh, an awareness of the grace of God. It's a, it's a response of someone who understands that an undeserved act of God on my behalf has transformed me from death to life. And when I'm aware of that, when I'm living in light of that, that truth provides, provides me with perspective. It allows me to see beyond the immediacy of my own circumstance. And so as, as Gretchen was pointing out, it's that we, we all need perspective in order to remain on purpose, which brings us to this second fundamental that, that Paul emphasized here, which I really think is, is kind of the, the primary thing that he, he wants to drive home in the life of the church as he's wrapping this up. To the Christians in Colossae and to you and I as we hear that, and that is the fundamental of purpose the fundamental of, of purpose. When I was a kid, I, um, I grew up in and around Dayton, Ohio. Um, and one of Dayton, Ohio's claims to fame, or really the only one that we have, is the Air Force Museum in uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Just, has anybody ever been there? Anybody been to the Air Force Museum? So when I was a kid, um, one, I lived really close to it, and my dad graduated with a degree in aeronautical engineering. 
So his idea of a good time for the family was to go to the Air Force Museum. And I spent copious amounts of hours wandering around those buildings, looking at planes, seeing the same things that I felt like I had seen a million times. In fact, I, I brought up a, a, a few pictures. That one on the top right there is one of the original Wright Brothers airplanes. Um, there's a SR-71, which is one of my favorite planes, and then there's a stealth fighter, and then there's just a really big plane with other planes underneath it. And that was pretty much the experience. You walked around and you just looked at all these incredible machines, and yet for a kid, it kind of felt like, what is the point? There's a marvel of engineering, things that were designed to, to fly, and we're staring at, at a building where they're not even moving. Like they're just sitting there, and I'm watching my dad read like every plaque in the whole, like he, he could be a tour guide of this place. But in contrast to that, the other thing we would do in the summer is that my dad would take us at the same place at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the air show, where some of these same planes are not sitting still, where they're doing stunts and they're doing flybys and you're watching these pilots do incredible things and there's biplanes and there's jet planes and the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds and all this amazing stuff and you're watching it do what it was created to do and that made sense to me. So there, there is something that is frustrating about, about operating with a, a lack of purpose. I think we experience that oftentimes in life. And so here the driving truth that Paul is getting at, that he wants the church to know and to live their lives by, is their purpose. Paul, Paul and, and Paul's prayer then is that he asks the church to pray for him in light of this purpose. In awareness of this purpose, verses three and four, Paul asks this of the church and he says, and pray for us, talking about him and Timothy and Epaphras, and he says, pray too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And do, you, do you hear the purpose there? that Paul's asking them to pray for it, to, that they may proclaim the mystery of Christ. You see, for Paul, this is, this is what it is all about. In his mind, this is why he exists, and he asks the others as followers of Jesus to pray on his behalf that he won't lose sight of this fundamental and this primary purpose, what he refers to as proclaiming the mystery of, of Christ. And Paul has already, again, sort of delved into what he's talking about when he talks about the mystery of Christ. This is, again, back in chapter 1, picking it up in verse 25. He says, I have become its servant, and referring to the church, I've become its servant by the commission that God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now has been discovered to, or, or been disclosed to the Lord's people, to them that has chosen to make known, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. N.T. Wright, in his commentary on this passage, when he's just talking about the mystery, pro proclaiming the mystery of Christ, he says it this way. He says, it's the secret plan of God for the salvation of the world as it's now been made known in and through Jesus Christ. It's, it's just the message of what God is, has accomplished in Jesus. His plan to bring salvation through his son that's been made known in him. And so the, the, this is central to everything that Paul is about. What is it that he wants above all else to make Christ known? 
And I love the language that, that Paul uses here because he talks about there being open doors for the message of the gospel to get out. Which is just sort of ironic when you think about the fact that Paul is writing this from prison. He, he doesn't say to the church, church, pray for my release from the change. He, in other letters, he will mention that, but here he says singularly focused. He doesn't ask that the doors of his prison would be opened up. He prays that that whatever the circumstances, that the good news about Jesus would advance. He is, in my mind, just remarkably focused on purpose. Like, I, I can't imagine that if I were writing you all a letter from a prison cell that I was in for the sake of the gospel... That, that I wouldn't at least mention in my list of prayer requests, like, hey, if you guys could be praying, then I get out of here. Like, that'd be great, right? But Paul just seems so singularly focused, so directed. This, this natural bent is for you and I, I, at least it is for me, is to hone in on the, the details of my circumstances, the specifics of my circumstances, the situation that I'm facing, right? And this is why this perspective that, that Paul brings here and that he talks about, that we looked out earlier when he talks about praying in and thanksgiving, it reminds us, it places us back in the work of Christ. It, it zooms out beyond our circumstances to a greater purpose, to God's purpose. When I heard, um, and I'm, I'm quoting Gretchen here on this, she, she said this, and I wanted to use her words exactly, but she said this this week on this passage. She said, Paul prays for opportunities to proclaim the gospel. He prays for clarity in his proclamation. Everything points towards the purpose. The whole prison thing, the chains, these are just details. The point is sharing the gospel, making disciples, sharing uh, showing them the way. See, now, now Paul, and he's asked this prayer for himself. He now, he now prays this for us in verses five and six. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. See, now, now Paul turns it and he directs it, points it specifically at the church. And Paul reminds them as he prays for the church at the very outset of this letter, right? And in chapter one, verse nine, remember what Paul prayed for them. He said, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. And we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives. What what. Paul reminds the church of here is the very same thing that he prayed for at the outset of his letter, that they would grow in their wisdom and their understanding of God so that they can proclaim the message that they themselves have been transformed by. He says, he says make the most of every opportunity. That, that, that phrase literally means to buy up the time. Buy up the time, live, live with purpose, live on purpose. And then he says, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, which when, when we think of salty language, we typically don't, like that's not a positive thing in ours. But in, in that, there's an idiom that was used culturally then to, to refer to something as being salty and the way it was discussed was uh, the idea of being interesting being engaging, that you wanted to, being whimsical, that you were sort of pulled into it. So he's like saying, don't, don't bore people with the gospel. Like season it with salt, that you may know how to answer everyone. Here is Paul's point. He's saying because of Jesus, through Jesus, by Jesus, in Christ, you have new life. And people are going to wonder about that. They're gonna, they're gonna ask you about that. They're wanna, gonna know more about that. And so he says, be ready to tell them. Be ready to tell them about Jesus. So when you have that, that neighbor that stops by the house unexpectedly at the worst possible time, Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. 
When, when you find yourself seated at the Thanksgiving dinner table next to that family member that you were desperately trying to avoid, Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. When you are on your flight to LA and the person that sits down to you is overly talkative, make the most of every opportunity. When a stranger or a loved one comes and asks you for help, Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. As he wraps up this letter, he's drawn up the play. He's, he's told us what, he's given us a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and he showed us the new life in him, what it looks like. And before he, he sends us back out, end of the world, back out to live this out, he reminds us of the fundamentals. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Connect regularly and relationally, conversationally with Jesus. And then remind yourself, live on purpose. Proclaim the good news about what Jesus has done to anyone who will listen. This. Make the most of every opportunity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we've spent um, over these weeks together looking at Paul's letter to this ancient church. And yet, Lord, what we recognize so quickly is that there is so much in this letter that is not only um, relevant, but just incredibly pertinent to the lives that we're living here and now. And so, Jesus, we ask that, that we would be reminded as followers of you to, to be connected to you rela relationally and conversationally, just as we talk, just as we stay alert to the work that you're doing, that you would tune our hearts to that. And that you would allow that to be um, the way that we live on purpose and with purpose. We pray that you would do this through, through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.